What's going on, guys? Wake up from Revolution. Here with my buddy Jim, uh, who's just joined me from Los Angeles. How are you, sir? Good. I, 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 I remember the first time I met you, I already liked you because you were wearing one of the coolest t-shirts because you were wearing a t-shirt that featured dachshunds. And as you know, I'm a dachshund fanatic, right? It's meant to be. Indeed so. <laughs> and then we shared a lovely dinner at my buddy Chong Min's house. Yes. And, uh, and then we started rapping a little bit about watches. And you mentioned that you had received I think one of the very first Grand Seiko Kodo tourbillons, right? Which you uh, have on your wrist already right here. today. Yep. So tell me a little bit about that watch, because that is the ultimate, like, kind of like watch nerds watch, right? Like, to, you have to, first of all, be into Grand Seiko, which makes you kind of a watch nerd, right? You know, <laughs> yes. makes you the, have the capacity to appreciate the incredible depth and content of Grand Seiko. Uh, and then you have to, I guess, have the capacity to be allocated and purchase one of these as well. So tell us the story about that watch. I've been a Grand Seiko fan for maybe the last couple of years. Uh, I don't have an extensive Grand Seiko, but I'm very familiar with a lot of their lineup. Um, I really always like underdog. Right? And Grand Seiko is like one of those always been written off. It's like, yeah, it's not going to be as good as Rolex. If you can't afford Rolex, go buy Grand Seiko. That's that's part of the reason why I love the underdog. Um, always want to bet on the dark horse uh, and trying to understand why they're this good, but no one appreciate them. Actually, I was uh, watching your reaction when you saw oh. Grand Seiko got a watch on Wonder. Thanks, man. And wow, this, this watch is something different. As I read more, I really get enamored by it. I'm almost obsessed because like this is like, this is so uh, unlike Grand Seiko. It took them 10 years to come up with this. So to me, that represent courage, which is really difficult to do in the business of watchmaking because courage is sometimes a failed product. That's why as I get more involved, uh, I'm like, well, how do I get, you know, this allocation? So I asked around and talked to a friend that is working at Grand Seiko and they're like, well, let me make a call. So somehow along the way, I got a call from Joe Kirk and we had an interview call, Zoom call, and trying to figure out like, why do you want to get this piece, <laughs> right? And then I explained to them, I was like, look, I think Grand Seiko is sort of in the fork in the road in which they have to innovate and do something, otherwise they, it's hard to compete, right, with the Rolex and everyone else. So they have to like innovate. And that's why um, when I saw this piece, I'm like, this is the future of Grand Seiko. And that's exactly what I told Joe is like, this is represent the future of Grand Seiko. You have to innovate or die. And then coming from technology background, I always thought like, you know, I respect that. I respect that you have to keep innovating. Grand Seiko never made this high comps piece, let alone something like this. So you were kind enough to show me this watch earlier, and I have to say, I absolutely adore it. Well, I'm looking at this watch, and it is just stunning to me as an architectural and technical masterpiece. Not only is everything coaxial, meaning the cage, the, the balance, uh, the remontoir d'égalité, uh, or constant force mechanism, but there's kind of an optical illusion to this watch. Like when I first saw it, I thought that the cage was jumping forward in one second, um, like uh, increments. But actually, it's a two-part cage. So part of it is moving smooth, like a traditional cage is, with the escape wheel geared to the fixed fourth wheel. And then another part is being driven by the remontoir, which is, I think, arming and rearming itself every one second. And that's the second part that you see that's moving forward. Now, the idea that they've integrated it to make it look like one piece is so cool and it kind of toys with your perception. Now you have become friends with a very interesting character who plays in a rock band and when he's not playing in a rock band he created this watch. So tell me your relationship with Takuma-san. Mr. Takuma-san, obviously uh, I've been reading about him and interesting a guy that's completely not a watchmaker can really toil for 10 years to figure out like this is the sort of this is the next thing there's a lot of thought behind it like owning it you get to see it every day it's just something about it that's magical like uh, the layout there's almost like three layers of different uh shades yeah and everything looks clean everything looks very balanced you don't you don't need to acquire a taste 
for this is like I've shown this to many of my friends who doesn't know like what this is and they pick this watch out of like the different watches that I've shown them and they're like what is this thing <laughs> so there's a premium I think when a watch is just calling your name that's why I feel like it's so special yeah I love it so Jim, I, I know I couldn't help but notice this is incredibly impressive looking attache case. And I know that you've got, brought some watches for us to check out together. Uh, may, may I see? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, let's see, there you go. Whoa, that is insanely cool. So I see an array of extraordinary horological riches arrayed, arrayed before me. There's a lot of watches in there, Jim. So I think that maybe what we should do is pick out a couple of watches, which we can talk about and how they're reflective of your taste in watches and maybe your evolution as a collector. So Jim, one of the first things that catches my eyes is you clearly like perpetual calendars. I see three perp cals here and each of these watches is such a different expression of that complication. So maybe we, we could start with the uh, LM Perpetual Calendar because I know that watch has an entertaining connection to the Coteau Tourbillon. Tell us a little bit about that, sir. I usually only collect watch that I really liked. Um, not so much of a hype person. And I know MBNF has been a hype watch for a while and people around me, fellow collector told me like, you should check out MBNF. And I'm like, well, I've checked them out and I feel like it doesn't really do anything to me. I was in uh, West Ham Rodeo and as I was buying my Moser, one of the guy there was like, hey, I think you should check out MBNF. And they come up with a new uh, perpetual calendar. I think you might like it. Uh, he's like, I should talk to John Mark, and you probably know John Mark as well. John Marbury's, yes. John Marbury's, yeah. yeah. And I had a Zoom call with them, and he showed me this piece. Right. And I've seen all the other iterations. I think they came out with like five different iterations. So when I saw that piece, I was like mind blown. Dude, this is sick. And I was like, wow, I love the aesthetic. Like I said, again, with Coda, they, this, I, the instant love is like a premium for me. Like, right. So when I saw this, like, this totally makes sense. First time they make it in steel, it's a salmon dial. There's a lot of monochromatic. So there's almost like a Kodo vibes. When you were saying earlier that you were thinking, you didn't think of yourself as an MBNF guy, were you, is it because you were thinking more of the super contemporary stuff, like the horological machines? And were you surprised at how much you liked the LM? Yes, I, I have saying like, risk don't lie. There's something about this piece that's like, undeniably beautiful. It's so stunning. At the end of the day, like our brains just like, oh yeah, I like that. And there's something about that that I think we should value. Yeah, I, I love this watch also because it's um, a representative of friendship, you know, and uh, Max Busier met Stephen McDonald, who's the guy who made this watch with him when he was uh, trying to rescue his very first project, um, the Horological Machine Number One. And Stephen McDonald ended up being kind of a, a key part of that process and they became really good friends. Mm -hmm. And then later in life, um, Stephen found himself in a difficult position because the project that he was working on fell through. And Max went to go speak to him because he'd heard about it. And as a good friend was like, dude, what can I do for you? And the story kind of goes that uh, Stephen's like, oh, well, I've actually always dreamed about doing a perpetual calendar. And Max was like, stop right there. I don't want to make no perpetual calendar. And right. he was like, right. why? And he goes, because they always break. And he said, well, actually, I had the idea for one that doesn't break or it's almost impossible to use incorrectly. Right. So I am fortunate enough to be familiar with this watch. And what's cool about it is that it's impossible to operate incorrectly. It just won't do anything. That's like, true. Right? And and I, no, no more push pin. Yes, exactly. And you've just got these uh, wonderful pushers as well, which uh, yeah. uh, operate so perfectly. Yeah. So let's go from there to um, this wonderful Alana One Perpetual Calendar. It was funny when you first showed it to me, I almost couldn't tell what it is because I've reached a point where my eyesight is so bad. Like I have to put like my reading glasses on to be, <laughs> to be able to read. Um, but this is like a masterclass in subtlety. As you can tell here, they, they cramp six different indications in long in one format. I had dinner with uh, Wilhelm Smith, right? right. The CEO of long in. And I asked him, does it design or complication? Like which one comes first? And he said, with long in is all about design first. It's one of the most unconventional perpetual calendars. And the only thing that looks kind of conventional on it basically is the, the date and the moon phase. But then the month is actually per peripheral and mm -hmm. it rotates around the outside of the dial. 
It's told by that indicator at six o'clock, which is so subtle. On top of that indicator is a tiny window to tell you where in the leap year cycle you are. Mm -hmm. And then you've got for the days of the week, you've got a retrograde indicator here underneath the, the date. Another thing that's interesting is there's 31 different perm uh, permutations of Longyear one. This is the only one that is uh, sort of have mirrored the layout. I'm, I'm sensing a kind of commonality here in terms of what you appeals to you. A lot of it is the layout of the dial and the design of the watch. It has to be, I wouldn't say symmetrical, but balanced, harmonious. Yeah, right? harmonious. Okay, so let's go to another perpetual calendar, and that is a uh, limited edition DB25 Debethune content perpetual made in a 40 mm case in grade five titanium. And it happens to be a Grail watch, which is a limited edition watch company I created. And I believe this is one of the very first pieces, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. thank you, Wei. I mean, every watch, uh, it sort of represents something to me, like Kodo represent courage to me. Um, Longy represent sort of perfections, strive for perfections. And to me, this represents friendships. I wouldn't be able to get this without your help. Then in that sense, it's like, and I don't know why you extended that offer. What I like about you is you're clearly not interested in watches in terms of the cultural signifiers that they are. And just because they're incredibly beautiful things that people have executed with the brilliance of their minds and the skill of their hands. And, and like when people love watches in such an honest way, it's very, very appealing to me. Yeah, I, I get into watch after I lost my dad and and obviously the first watch that I picked up was Speedmaster. And there's something about the watch that gave me that um, positive vibes. Obviously I was low in serotonin and all the other neurotransmitter that's missing in my brain, but somehow the watch kind of helped me uh, feel better. As I collect, I realized like there's more to it than the object. It's actually the people behind this. And I realized that that's why when I met you, there's that, wow. I feel like watch is just a personal passport that you meet people that are similar to you and understand you in a deeper manner. That's sort of the, uh, what I feel with this watch. So thank you about, gift. I, I love this watch, it's obviously. Thank, thank you, <laughs> it's, it's, I, couldn't, I couldn't go to a better guy. Now you'd mentioned um, that you love Omega, that you love Speedmasters. So maybe let's go to a watch that, when people think of the Speedmaster is definitely not the first Speedmaster they would think of, but when they see it, they're just going to be blown away by it. And that is this incredible rainbow Speedmaster. Uh, this thing is just incredible, right? Um, so, you know, I love it because it takes probably the most pragmatic tool watch in the world, the watch that NASA adopted as an official instrument for their astronauts, a watch that rescued the astronauts in mm -hmm. Apollo 13, um, helping them to sort of like do their critical burn so they could angle the craft in the, the right angle before, so they wouldn't skip off of the atmosphere when they were re-entering Earth. And they took that and transformed it into this, which is just an object of sheer beauty. The reason I get this piece is like, oh, it's because Omega is trying to do something different. Right. So I felt like I want to support Omega in, in, in a way that they're able to like come up with something so different, right? It's, it's hard for them to make this. They, they can probably only make two or three just because it's, this is not in their wheelhouse. And, and in general, I feel like this is done better than let's say Rolex. The watch is still a Speedmaster. Yeah. You know, you, you could still see everything there, you know, that represent it. Speedmaster. Yeah. It's definitely such a, a Speedmaster. Um, there's a couple of things that are, I really love about this watch. And as an example of it still being a Speedmaster and having that integrity, on Speedmaster dials, um, the indexes are stepped, right? And here they've kept the step even though the indexes are made of sapphires. And they've done it by not making the index out of one piece, which would have been easy for them, but making it out of two pieces. So there's an angle to it, which I absolutely love. Then on top of that, if I look at the watch and I pick one stone and I look at the stone on either side, you're gonna see that the um, stones on either, either side look so similar to the one in the center that you can't tell it's a different color almost, right? That's Yet right. when you take the watch and look at it from this perspective, you can see that there's such an abrupt change from section to section. Right. So you're like, how do they do this? The gem selection is incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
I happen to know, because I know the guys at Omega pretty well, um, that this watch is really hard to get, right? And even if you know you can afford it or whatever, they just don't allocate it to anyone. They only want to allocate it to people that they feel are really serious collectors and have a true passion for the brand. So they clearly identified that in you, and the fact that you got it is also, it's perfect. I mean, I couldn't think of it going to a better guy, so that's awesome. Yeah. Right? That's just luck, I guess. All right, let's go from there to okay. one of my favorite brands, which is Cartier. And I always say that if Rolex is the king of sports and Patek is the king of complications, then we have to agree that Cartier is the king of elegance. And this is a phenomenal watch. So it is a tonneau, um, but it's a two time zone tonneau. So you've got a dial on the top and on the bottom, and each of which has its own hour minute hand. And you've got two separate crowns, which means they can be adjusted separately. Now, what's really interesting is that they were making this watch back in the 90s already. They had uh, CPCP versions of this watch as well. But in those versions of the watch, the movement was either quartz or the mechanical versions had just two tiny movements in here. But when you do a skeletonized movement, you're going to see everything that's inside. And what I really respect about this watch is that they created its very own caliber for it, which is one movement one balance, one barrel, and two little trains that you know go to each of the dials. And it goes to show you that Cartier certainly has the capacity to be technical. But as Cyril Vineron, the CEO of Cartier says, when we are technical, it's at the service of design. And that's a perfect example. So tell me about this. Like I said, I always love betting the underdog. The business of watchmaking, it's different than the watchmaking itself, right? So Cartier, obviously one of the most profitable company, partly because they realized like, oh, you know, it, all it is is volume times profit. So they ended up, well, if you do more complications, you can't push out as many volumes. So thereby, let's go do something design focus and then just crank up the volume. So to me, it's like the obvious pick is to go buy or collect the most complicated Cartier. Tell me why do you like uh, Cartier, by the way? So it's interesting because I think that like as a watch collector, you go through different like phases. And eventually you come to love all of these, but the phase for me kind of went like, I started off wanting, like, loving sports watches, right? And then kind of getting into military theme watches, because as a young man, you always want to be a badass, even though you're not, right? Uh, then you start to get into complicated watches, and then you start to get into movements, and by virtue of that, you get into independence. Uh, and then it becomes all about the internal content, and it becomes about like, you know, how nerded out can you be in terms of vibrational speed or escapements or the, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a point where you're like, oh man, my brain is so full of everything. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I just need something beautiful mm. and simple. And then you get to the shapes of Cartier and you're like, oh my God, this is it, yeah. right? Like when I put on a Cartier, whether it's a Ton Cintre or my Crash or uh, a Tonneau or any of the beautiful shapes of Cartier, it's like you're entering into this like moment of beauty and the calm that it provides and having something that's pure relatively simple, but just so stunning on the wrist. But I love this watch also because when Cardi does do something complex, it never forgets about beauty. Yep. And so it has Absolutely. both of those, you know, and, and, and that is, like putting this on right now, I had never thought about wanting to own this watch. Now I really want to own this watch. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Um, so bravo. And then I guess the last watch in our tray here, mm. and this is a phenomenal Moser Streamliner chronograph but made in collaboration with a friend of mine named Eric Chang, who owns a company called Undefeated. Uh, tell me about this watch, because I love it. So Streamliner, obviously, is one of those product, right, um, that can stand up to Royal Oak, I would argue, better than Royal Oak to, to some degree. This piece is just, just another level. Uh, the fact that uh, it has a painting, as it symbolizes a tiger, there's restraints, uh, nothing like it, like in the market. I also love it because it's the first watch that had the courage to kind of embrace the collision between high watchmaking and street culture as well. Like I think what Eric has created is like a, an incredible brand that has so much resonance for it. And it's become like one of the most popular uniforms of today is streetwear, right? I also applaud the Melan brothers, um, Bertrand and Edward for realizing that and going there at a time where no other watch brand was re really brave enough to go. And as a result, you have a collaboration that is just so like 
I don't even want to say edgy, just so wonderfully, like vibrantly contemporary, yet at the same time retains all of like the authenticity of something beautifully crafted. So that's yeah. that's an amazing watch. So Jim, I got to thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you for bringing your magical suitcase. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the kind things you say. When I look at that watch, uh, the day with you, and also I think of friendship too, and it's a pleasure to be your friend, my friend. Thank you, Wei. Cheers. Thanks.